Today, we will be exploring the relationship between Oregon's forests and the wildlife that call them home. More specifically, we are going to take a look at how actively managed forests are protecting, and in many cases improving, wildlife habitat. The program is brought to you by the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Who is OFRI? The Oregon Forest Resources Institute is a state agency. It was created by the state legislature in 1991. OFRI's mission is to improve public understanding of Oregon's forest resources and to encourage environmentally sound forest management. We do that through many programs, including K-12 education, landowner education, and through programs like this Speaker's Bureau, which allow OFRI to talk to a wide range of Oregonians about forest management. In Oregon, our forests are full of animals. Some are very large, like the elk seen here. Others, such as the Fender's blue butterfly, are small and may go unnoticed. And the diversity of species is also large, from the well-known mammals all the way down to the aquatic bugs, whose names only scientists can pronounce. Not only does Oregon have a large variety of animal species, we've also got a large variety of forests. Oregon contains over a dozen different forest types. Think about the forests on the coast compared to the forests outside Bend. Climates vary. Ages of the forest vary. Tree species vary. And even if two forests share these first three characteristics, individual stands of trees vary quite a bit as well. Here are photos of three forests in the coast range, yet they look pretty different from one another. Maybe the best way to illustrate the relationship between forest habitat and animals is through this 90-second animation. This is part of an OFRI series called Forest Fact Breaks. They're short vignettes that cover all kinds of forest issue topics. You can see more of these on the OFRI website at OregonForests.org. Time for another Forest Fact Break, brought to you by the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Today's topic, wildlife. We love our forests, Aww. and so do numerous species of animals. But no two forests are alike, and different animals prefer different kinds of forests. So, why do forest animals live where they do? Mainly, it comes down to what they consider a good dinner um, nom, 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 nom. and what kind of home they like. Some animals like to live in older forests, with large trees, a diverse forest canopy, and lots of fallen logs and snags. These forests can be 200 years old or more. Other animals prefer a young, open forest because of the flowers, berries, and other vegetation that are found there. Um, nom, 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 nom. Yum! These are the forests that grow first after trees are harvested or after a forest fire. And other animals like a whole range of habitats and will travel from one forest type to another because some animals just like variety. And here's the really interesting part. As forests grow from young to old, the kinds of animals living there will change as the structure of the forest changes. Today, you might be neighbors with a goldfinch. Tomorrow, it could be a salamander. Forests are changing all the time. Pretty cool. And that's the story on wildlife. Check out more forest fact breaks or visit OregonForest.org. Yay, forest! So why do forest animals live where they do? As the movie showed, it often comes down to food and shelter. But space or range is an issue as well. Dozens of birds can get along in a five-acre forest, maybe only one black bear. So animals like a lot of space and they like to move. Animals will travel and settle to forest habitat that suits their needs. If their current habitat doesn't supply them with all they need, they'll move to somewhere that does. So animals don't stay in one place for long. Similarly, forests don't stay in the same condition forever. Forests are not static. There is this impression that before Western civilizations got to Western Oregon, there was nothing but a sea of old growth. Geologic research has proven that false. Oregon forests were affected by natural disturbance, which created a state of consistent renewal. Fire, wind, disease, these were continually creating young forests from mature forests across the landscape. Historically, the forest landscape was a patchwork of ages and forest structure, and the animals adapted to find their preferred habitat. You've probably noticed Western civilization has settled in nicely amongst Oregon's forests. Urbanization has disturbed or even removed areas of habitat. 
Nearly every acre of forest in Oregon is managed to some degree or another. Active forest management alters the landscape. The fire, wind, and disease of the past have been replaced, in most part, by thinning and harvest. Yet forest management can help us achieve particular kinds of wildlife habitat, if that's the goal. So let's take a look at some forest structure as they relate to age classes. We'll start with young, open forests. These are post-disturbance forests. Again, that could be the new forest after a fire or windstorm. In western Oregon, though, these are usually the forests planted by landowners after a harvest. They are characterized by young trees, shrubs, grasses, berries, and lots of goodies for animals to browse. Some of the species you'll find in young forests include skunk, black-tailed deer, black bear, mountain bluebird, deer mouse. These are just a few of obviously dozens of species that frequent young forests. Next are the middle-aged forests. Now, age is kind of irrelevant here. What we're talking about mostly is a forest where healthy trees have outgrown the brush and grasses and are developing a maturing canopy while supporting ground vegetation. In western Oregon, this happens relatively quickly. In eastern Oregon, where trees grow more slowly, this can take many more years. Here's an interesting point about middle-aged forests. Many animals are found there, but few prefer it exclusively. And here's a sample roster of animals from the middle-aged forest structure. Roosevelt elk, Douglas squirrel, Cooper's hawk, raccoon, Pacific tree frog. And finally, we have older forest stands. These forests have larger, older trees and a more complex canopy. They have a highly developed understory. And one of the most important characteristics of older forests is that they have a large variety of structure within them. Old trees, young trees, fallen dead trees, snags, decaying wood. All of this structure makes attractive wildlife habitat. Sample animals, woodpeckers, spotted owl, flying squirrel, hoary bat, bobcat. So again, as forests change from young to middle age to old, so too does its inhabitants change. Animals are looking for particular habitat. They're not as concerned about the zip code or the local schools. So when we discuss wildlife habitat and managed forests, there are always a few topics that seem to enter the conversation. We'll cover a few of them here. The first one, which should be no surprise, is old growth. According to wildlife scientists, old growth is a classification of habitat structure, not age. If an animal is traditionally found in old growth habitat, they're not concerned about how old their home tree is. They're interested in structure. Now here's an interesting thing about forest management. If old growth habitat is what we're trying to achieve in a given forest, then active forest management can get us there faster than nature can. Fewer trees growing faster, standing dead trees, down logs, forest management can work to achieve these in, say, 60 years, where it would take nature over 100. So just remember, old growth is a classification of structure, not age. The next topic of interest is forest fire. We, as a society, are hesitant about managing older forests and wilderness area. And yet, we're still really good about putting out fires. Yet, because we've gotten so good at putting them out, forests that were used to seeing frequent fires, such as the forests just outside of Bend, have missed their natural fire intervals. This means that when the fires hit, they're larger and more intense than historic norms. When catastrophic fire takes the forest, the habitat goes with it. So, it's a societal trade-off. When forest managers enter older stands or wilderness areas to perform thinning and selective harvest, that is disturbance. However, it may be just enough disturbances to help a forest avoid the kind of catastrophic fire that would wipe out the entire habitat. Cut some trees to save the rest of the forest. It's a tricky balance. Here's one that creates a lot of discussion. Monoculture. In western Oregon, Douglas fir is the dominant species. That's how it is today, and that's how it has always been. In fact, west of the Cascades, if you guess Douglas fir when you see a tree, you'd be right seven out of ten times. This is also the primary species for producing many of the wood products that we use every day. Is habitat diversity reduced in a monoculture? Perhaps. A variety of tree and shrub species will naturally create a more varied collection of structure. But it's a trade-off. 
Working forests dominated by Douglas fir allow the forest sector to create the wood supply that society needs by managing fewer total acres. Given that Douglas fir is the predominant species anyway, given natural seeding of other species, and given landowners now planting more diverse species, the monoculture issue is not as large as some make it out to be. However, think back to our forest classifications. A mix of species is not as important as a mix of structure. Snags, down logs, and a varied age class can create significant wildlife habitat, even if it's a forest of all the same species. A Douglas fir forest with a large variety of structure has better wildlife habitat than a forest with 40 different kinds of trees that are all 15 years old. But here's something to appreciate. The majority of Western Oregon forest landowners do plant a mix of species. Remember one of the first slides that said different forests prefer different growing conditions? The same applies. Even on 10 acres of forest land, if you're planting in wet spots, you may plant western red cedar or red alder. Got a hilly slope? It may be dug fir or hemlock. Sunny south slope? Try some Willamette Valley ponderosa pine. Some of those choices are based on the value of the timber, but guess what? Most forest landowners like wildlife as much as you and I. Landowners are doing a lot to improve fish and wildlife habitat in Oregon's forests. Some landowners are managing their land specifically for wildlife habitat. In that instance, forest management can help to, again, create the structure that is going to be attractive to songbirds, deer, elk, or even fish in aquatic life. And many of the landowners in the state are improving wildlife habitat purely on a voluntary basis. Their efforts, along with strong Oregon laws that already protect wildlife habitat in Oregon's forests, are helping make good wildlife habitat even better. So, in summary, the animals in Oregon's forests are drawn to different forest age classes and different forest structure. Forests are dynamic. As forests change, so do their wildlife residents. Animals prefer food, structure, and space, not zip codes. Habitat diversity happens at a landscape level, not a per acre level. Not every forest has to be everything to every animal or every forest landowner. And finally, forest protection laws and volunteer efforts by landowners continue to improve the wildlife habitat of all of our forests across Oregon. To find out more, please visit the Oregon Forest Resources Institute website, oregonforests.org.